Hi folks, Martin here, and it's a uh, fine and glorious sunny Sunday morning, and I thought that I would uh, do a quick video to uh, compare my print and play copy of uh, the game Pulp Detective, um, which I built last February 2018, to the uh, shipping version, which uh, arrived a couple of days ago. And then at the very, very end of the uh, comparison, after I do that, I'll just share some of my brief impressions of the game. I've been playing it quite a bit, and um, I wanted to tell you what I thought about it. So we'll see you in a bit. So here's my print and play copy of Pulp Detective on this side, and here's the production version laid out similarly on this side. I apologize for the glare. Um, I think it will um, subside as I get closer. So first of all, let's take a look at my print and play version of the um, kind of main cards here. So here are the investigator cards. Here's the guy that I've been playing so far, Lucky Dan Hamilton, his special action. He can give up stamina to um, roll a red paperboy die or gray underworld die. And if you compare Lucky Dan to his production version, you'll notice that they've changed, they've upgraded the card art. Of course, the cards are, uh, the, the art is very vibrant. Uh, you've got your uh, linen feel, very deluxe, really nicely produced cards. So here's the one case that came with the uh, print and play preview. This is the case of the Death's Door Damsel. Uh, 24 hours to solve the case of the kidnapped heiress. Um, uh, spoiler alert, I've never saved her. And here's the production version. Um, and uh, same thing, exactly. But um, the core box uh, pr production version also comes with two other cases. The uh, case of the pilfered photo and the case of the bullied banker. And those are tougher. So if you're starting out, um, start with the uh, case of the Death's Door Damsel. All right, if you look at the uh, stamina tracker over here and the clues tracker, in this game, very briefly, um, you have to acquire clues, three or four of them, depending on the case, to be able to solve the case. The most I've ever gotten so far is two out of four. Uh, this looks the same as the uh, production version. This icon means stamina, this icon means clues. If you compare the items uh, tracker, it also looks the same. So you will have an opportunity to get various items, um, and it's the same as the print and play copy. If you look at the uh, criminal's card, so this is the criminal who has done the bad deed um, that you will eventually uh, have to defeat uh, in this game. Uh, it's almost the same. I think they've, what they've done is they've done a slight change of the card art. Um, if you look at, if you compare this side, you'll notice that the uh, card art is slightly different. Otherwise, um, pretty much uh, the same. Moving on to the um, storyline deck. So the backs of the storyline cards have letters. F stands for follow a lead, C stands for cliffhanger, and I stands for um, informant, right? You gotta go hit the streets and rouse those informants to get your clues. Um, and if you compare them to the uh, shipping version, once again, um, just really nice um, art here. Uh, very, very, uh, the, the art really pops because of the quality of the printing and the uh, quality of the paper. Um, very quickly, the, uh, there's an icon in the upper uh, right of the card back that tells you what that card is more likely to give you if you choose it as your current storyline card. So follow a lead card is more likely, although not 100%, to give you um, a, an item. That's what this icon means. A cliffhanger card is more likely to give you stamina. And an informant card is more likely to give you clues. And again, clues are what you need um, to win this game. In the uh, production version, there are 27 um, storyline cards. Nine follow -a leads, nine cliffhangers, nine informants. In the um, Kickstarter, I'm sorry, the preview version, there are apparently 36 cards. So there's a few more cards in the uh, in the kickstart, I'm sorry, in the preview version of the game. Uh, functionally still the same. The one difference, if you compare these cards, not an informant card, let's do a cliffhanger. So if you do a side-by-side -side comparison of the uh, cards themselves, you'll notice that there's extra, um, these are called cohesive storyline um, icons uh, on the uh, shipping version. And um, if you're able to match these icons to the uh, icons of an adjacent card, then you'll get an extra opportunity, one or two extra opportunities to re-roll. Um, and that is absent. Uh, I guess that mechanic wasn't yet implemented in the um, uh, print and play version. 
Um, that's the only change. Um, otherwise, the print and play version is um, very playable. If you look at the uh, other components of the um, production version, you'll notice that it comes with four um, yellow and four black markers. Um, playing solo, you only need four of these markers. Um, so I'm going to guess that the, uh, the other four are for if you're playing the two-player variant. Um, and then if you compare it to uh, my print-and-play copy, I stole these Euro cubes from uh, Scott Ohm's Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms, which I really don't like to play solo. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the colors really don't matter because they're just for marking statuses. If you look at the investigation dice, the game comes with four yellow investigation dice with four different uh, faces here, the uh, footsteps, I believe that one's called Hit the Streets. Um, this one, uh, the newspaper is called Word on the Street. The bullet is called Persuasion. And uh, I, I forget the name of the, uh, the eye. Um, and you'll notice that there's an asterisk and that asterisk denotes that that particular die will have more than one of that particular face. So there's a higher probability, higher percentage that if you roll that die, you'll get that face. And if you look at my uh, print and play copy, you'll notice what I did. This is the first time I ever tried to do um, custom dice. So uh, I chose uh, dice of the same appropriate color. I cut out the, uh, I printed and cut out the faces and then I glued them. Uh, but, you know, my cutting skills and my gluing skills weren't up to par yet last February when I made these. So um, you can really see the kind of rough edges there. Um, so it's not that great of a production. As well, you have this red paper boy die. So certain items and certain abilities will allow you to access um, the network of paper boys uh, strewn throughout the city. And they'll be able to help you out uh, or not. Uh, and the gray kind of underworld connections die. So here in this game, uh, good people sometimes have to do bad things and associate with bad people. And that's what that underworld connections die kind of represents. So these are uh, extra dice that could potentially help you achieve, um, match the icons on the storyline cards. And if you just look very quickly at the uh, production versions, they're all very nicely engraved, very nicely produced. Um, really one of the highlights of the components of this game. Last thing I'll take a look at are the twist tokens. So um, these are the shipping twist tokens. You can see the size here relative to the dice and compare. They're double-sided, so you've got a black side and you've got a yellow side. And these guys have... Um, Basically, you, uh, you, uh, every time you fail a storyline card, you, not, you don't match, you, as a consolation prize, you get a twist token. And that twist token, you can turn it in later on to um, increase the possibility that you'll be able to get a match later on. So early failures earn you twist tokens, and that kind of helps you later on in the mid and late game. Um, and you can also use the flip side of the twist token to kind of match um, or remember as a marker of um, what you had previously rolled uh, sometimes uh, you'll have four dice, but your stamina is so high that you'll actually get to roll five of them. So you have to kind of mark, um, you know what, that die was uh, footsteps. And then I'm going to take this die with a, that marker to help me remember, and then I'll re-roll that. Okay. Um, very quickly, looking at the twist markers that I had made for my uh, print and play copy, um, I made them much bigger uh, because the only circle punch I had at the time was a one and a quarter inch circle punch. So uh, I made the twist markers bigger so that I could use my circle punch so that I could get um, kind of straight uh, edges here. And um, there's, these are also double-sided. One side is white, uh, the, the graphic is white, and the other one is kind of a gold um, because of a printing error that I turned into, uh, just I integrated into my game. And the core is... Um, two layers of uh, placemat vinyl. I would, at the time, I had a, quite a bit of um, vinyl that uh, I was getting from dollar store placemats and I used it. So, you know, these feel good. They're, you know, they're, they're light. Um, they're, they're, I think, pretty well produced for the time. I would certainly change the way I produce these uh, going forward. I'd probably use cardboard nowadays. Um, you know, so uh, that is my quick comparison of the print and play uh, version of uh, Pulp Detective on the left side and the production version on the right side. All right, so now that we've done that kind of side-by-side -side comparison of my print and play copy and the production copy, and you've seen just how much nicer the production copy is, now I thought I would tell you a little bit about my impressions of uh, Todd Sanders' Pulp Detective. 
Um, it's not what I expected. What I was expecting initially was a story-driven, kind of a high narrative, you know, experience. And it uh, turns out not to be that at all. Um, you can, exerting some creative effort, bring the story to life for yourself, but that's kind of not the point. Um, it's more like a, a kind of mechanical exploration of how to take a dice chucker and then how to layer on some kind of elegant mechanics to, um, to mitigate that randomness. I would consider uh, Pulp Detective a masterclass, especially for game designers, um, in how to mitigate randomness in kind of various kind of elegant ways. So, um, for example, there's the investigator ability that once a turn, um, it allows you to lower your stamina. This is Lucky Dan Hamilton's investigate ability. He's the only investigator I've played so far. Um, so once a turn, you can lower your stamina um, to be able to uh, affect how your dice rolled for that storyline card. Um, another way of mitigating randomness is if your stamina lowers to a certain level, that also uh, allows you to give up some time to be able to affect um, what you had rolled uh, with your investigation dice. Yet another way are the cohesive plot icons that appear on each card, uh, each storyline card, um, that depending on how you lay them down in your tableau, that could give you one or even two opportunities per turn to re-roll your dice. So, there's and there's items as well that allow you to uh, affect and change um, how you had rolled. And it's the remembering and the creative kind of use of these that are the key to winning this very, very difficult game. Because the percentages alone of being able to match the icons printed on each storyline card based on just a natural roll of d6s um, is very low. So it's remembering, um, using, and kind of like um, remixing all of these different ways to mitigate randomness that are the key to Pulp Detective and the key to why I personally feel like I want to come back and I keep wanting to play uh, Pulp Detective. Um, it's It becomes very addictive. It's also very fast to play. Um, I would liken it to the experience of playing um, Hostage Negotiator by A.J. Porfirio, which is another kind of random dice chucker where you have to use your cards and you have to kind of figure out and look at um, what is available to me, what is possibly available to me each turn. It forces you to be resourceful uh, to be able to affect and change how your dice rolled. Um, so, so in my head, as far as games I've played, I think these two are very similar, Hostage Nego Negotiator and Pulp Detective. That said, I would say that Pulp Detective is much more um, kind of mature, kind of elegant. So um, if you're going to get this game, don't expect it to have a strong narrative. You yourself have to kind of exert effort, creative effort to bring that narrative to life, but really embrace it as a masterclass, a tour de force in how to mitigate randomness using game mechanics. So that's my impression of Todd Sanders' Pulp Detective. Hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next time.